Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. All right. Phil Kraske, thank you for coming back to visit us here at uh, Fortress on a Hill. Excited to talk to you today. Yeah, good to talk to you again, Henry. Been a while. It has been a while. Has been a while. Um, so uh, t- today we're talking about uh, uh, a legacy of chains. Your new uh, your new book that's just come out, and it's a uh, it's uh, a novella. It's not not a not a traditional novel. And some other you've uh, also included some other short stories. Um, let's begin with you talking a little bit about your, your new book. Tell us about the novella and, and how you got started with the, uh, with the concept. Okay. Um, the, uh, the story in order to tell, tell it, uh, I've got to go into a little history here. Um, the story deals with the Vietnam war, which ended in 1973. And of course, at the end of the war, there was an exchange of prisoners, the prisoners of war on both sides. And in Washington, they were quite surprised when the Vietnamese only sent back 600 men. They were expecting more than double that. And the Vietnamese quietly let it be known to Washington that when you guys pay the war reparations mentioned in the treaty, then you'll get back the rest of your men. The Vietnamese had done the same tactic to the French after that war uh, as well. The French paid, the French got their men back. But for different reasons, Washington never paid, and Vietnam never sent the men back. And for years and years, there were rumors coming out of Vietnam of people seeing uh, prisoners and so on and so forth. Well, anyways, my story is about, uh, takes place in the year 2010. Nine men, American prisoners of war, escaped from Vietnam on a ship. They go through the Indian Ocean, they go through the Suez Canal, they're crossing the Mediterranean, and the ship captain is getting, uh, he's getting messages from the Americans that they want to stop the ship, they want to search the ship, they think there's something wrong, they're a terrorist, this and that. The captain gets cold feet. <clears throat> And so as he's passing through the Straits of Gibraltar between Morocco and Spain, he sets the men down in a life raft and calls the Spanish Coast Guard. And the Spanish Coast Guard comes and picks them up. So the story begins. I I review all of the history in the book. But anyways, the story begins when an American diplomat from the embassy in Madrid goes down to the south coast and finds these men. And uh, they tell him that they're prisoners of war and that they've escaped and so on. And the diplomat's first uh, idea is, well, okay, I'll take you guys in a bus about 50 miles up the coast of Spain here on the Atlantic side. And there's an American naval base there and they can process you and return you to the States. And he doesn't know anything about this controversy uh, about uh, the prisoners of war because he was, he was a baby when uh, the war ended. Uh, But the prisoners warn him, look, we're not so sure that they're going to be happy to see us. And they explain a little about how Washington has always denied that there were any prisoners left. So the diplomat, to play it uh, uh, carefully, he sets the men up in in a country hostile there in Spain. And he goes about the business of trying to repatriate the men. And that basically is uh, is the story. So uh, I got the idea um, basically 
from reading over the years about this controversy that, you know, there were prisoners left. So I finally looked into it and uh, found that in, indeed it, it, it was true that there were several hundred men left. And at the end of my book, in fact, uh, there's a, a bibliography at the, at the end of the novella. There's a, a bibliography of uh, all of the different sources that I looked at. It, it makes really very interesting reading, very, very sad reading as well, because you see, you know, uh, Washington denying everything and committees formed and uh, denials of the evidence and so on and so forth. It's really a pretty, uh, pretty morbid sort of uh, subject, but uh, there it is. So uh, the um, w one person that that gets uh, gets a big mention in your book, um, and and as far as far as I understand everything that you shared about him is the actual history is mm -hmm. Robert Garwood, the uh, American POW who came back to the United States uh, almost what was it six years? Six years later, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The uh, yeah. official withdrawal. Can you? Um, Talk a little bit more about Garwood and um, kind of his story and how this fits into your mm -hmm. into your novella. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Garwood was a Marine private who was captured, I think it was in 66, 1966, and he was. Um, sort of taken under the wing of another veteran prisoner when he got to his first jungle camp, just a very crude jungle stockade out in the middle of nowhere, which was the first of several that Garwood went through. But anyways, this guy told him, look, the number one thing here is that you have to make yourself useful to the Vietnamese. Otherwise, they let you die. And the conditions were, the conditions were horrible, horrible. And he also taught Garwood the language because you can't be useful if you can't communicate. And Garwood must have been pretty good with languages because he soaked it right up. And uh, so he made himself useful. He was a, a poor farm boy from uh, Indiana. And so he was repairing uh, the equipment of the Vietnamese. He was repairing their trucks. He was you know, doing all kinds of things. And uh, the war ended in 73 and they still didn't let him go. And he just sort of bided his time and made himself useful. And finally, in 1979, after 14 years in Vietnam, he managed to get to, to pass a note to a European. The European went back to London where he was based and got the note uh published in the guardian and the bbc and also gave a short interview to these people saying that yes he talked to garwood and this is the story all right so garwood got out and it seems that that was just the first of his two nightmares he he uh got back to the states and was immediately charged with being a traitor and a collaborator because of course he had been collaborating with the Vietnamese, and there were other Vietnamese uh, American POWs who had seen him. And there's a lot of controversy about exactly what Garwood did and didn't do. But the point here is, Henry, that a lot of prisoners, when they got back to America, uh, they were looking at some of them at the same types of charges that they had helped the Vietnamese, that they had talked, that they, they had cooperated, etc. None of the charges of any prisoner were ever brought. They were all dropped and, and nothing ever happened. But not with Garwood. They, of course, had a problem with Garwood, which, which was that he might have seen other prisoners. And this, of course, would, uh, you know, do, uh, uh, would destroy the de denials of Washington that, you know, other, you know, no prisoners were left in Vietnam. So what did they do? They court-martialed him, and they eventually drummed him out of the army with a dishonorable discharge, which meant that he forfeited 14 years of back pay, a, a, a ton of money. 
And uh, he actually fought his case all the way to the Supreme Court, which finally refused to hear his case. And so was was stuck with this. Um, he later campaigned to get, you know, other prisoners of war back, you know, from the United States and so on and so forth. But because of all the charges against him, uh, you know, his reputation had been pretty much blackened. And so none of his testimony was really taken seriously. And it was basically eventually just used as uh, background material for people who were investigating later on. And uh, so a very sad story of, uh, of Garwood. And uh, so I sort of use that as a kind of uh, um, uh, model for what I'm doing in, in the story. To me, it seemed that there was that the the in addition to everything else that was hard about the homecoming for for Vietnam troops around around that time, that between 73, when all of these there was a whole bunch of other POWs who were also they weren't some of them didn't end up getting charged, but they were under a very similar cloud as yeah. Garwood was. That by the time that he got home, you're dealing with, you know, and, and that's something the military is kind of going through right now post Iraq and Afghanistan is that you're they're trying to move back to a, a relative peacetime army. And I could imagine mm -hmm. that the, the the idea of fodder for those, you know, some of those newly minted officers or other people who didn't get to serve in Vietnam, that going after Robert was it could be seen as a boon to them you know i have the chance you know yeah. legally and ethically i have a chance to stick it to this you know this collaborator you know yeah. if, if we want to coin it that way mm -hmm. um, so i wanted to uh before we go further on um i wanted to read for everybody what the uh, official code of conduct is that the united states gives to its forces in captivity and specifically about how difficult and unfair some of the conditions that it mentions are, just so everybody has it kind of mm -hmm. in there. Um, I am an American fighting in the forces that guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. I will never surrender of my free, own free will. If in command, I will never surrender the members of my command while they still have the means to resist. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all available means. I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information nor take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. Should I become a prisoner of war, I am required to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies. I will never mm -hmm. forget that I am an American fighting for freedom responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I know when I was a, when I was a young man and I, and I read through that it, a, a great majority of it made sense to me, but n now after everything I've read and learned um, that it, it really places prisoners of war in a very untenable and hostile position, just trying to maintain what the military wants to see as allegiance to them. Um, sure. That, you know, following the orders of officers over you. Okay, well, that, that does make sense, but what if they're complete <clears throat> actions that they want you to do, make, make really poor choices? Um, I also don't understand the, the contradiction of a person not being able to accept parole yet you're supposed to continually try to escape. You know, mm. if, they, if they let me go, I can't accept that. But if I escape and possibly hurt people on the way out, that's more acceptable. Um, mm. 
and going back to some of those other guys that were, were scrutinized when they when uh, when they were released in in 73 that I know there was a group of them about six or seven of them who had been under the um let's call it POW command of a of an air force colonel and that he was one of the people that accused them of similar crimes that Garwood was in terms of potentially collaborating with the enemy I know you know there's there's things I read that talked about that they uh, sold POW started to to try to speak Vietnamese started to to dress like them um and to me these are all basic um, uh, basic pieces of survival of trying to you know to, just to make it through the situation yeah sure 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 and, you know henry uh, just an interesting note uh, my uncle who was in world war ii um he grew up speaking german in his house um it was uh, uh their first language before they spoke english and so he survived when he was captured with his troops, he survived in the prisoner of war camp because he was the translator between the Germans and the Americans. So you can imagine, you know, you, you're in an, an absolutely horrible situation like that. And so you bend the rules, everybody does. And the, the conditions in, in the, uh, the, the Vietnamese prisoner of war camps were just, you know, the, if you were in, the Hanoi Hilton, the, the, the famous prison in Hanoi, actually, that wasn't such a bad deal. It was in the jungle stockades where, you know, anything went. And in fact, the man who had taken Garwood under his wing was later beaten to death by guards because of a, an infraction of the rules. So you can imagine what, what Garwood was up against. Well, it, it, it seems to be a, you know, a, a simple case of trying to survive. But Americans were so were so focused on, you know, allegiance and how things look and how, you know, it, it, it's it's not. Uh, it doesn't it seems <laughs> it's beyond culturally ignorant, you know, because mm. like what you're describing with your uncle is that men like him could easily easily come under a cloud from their for, fellow POWs sure, and sure. say that, you know, they're collaborating and, and, and what have you when in reality they may be surviving just in just the same way seeing sure. mm -hmm. you know garwood seeing this this or i don't know that he actually saw it but knowing that um that that was the penalty that potentially yeah. you know, that um that, you know being beaten to death for infracting rules you know that really paints you paints you into a corner you know sure. It's, sure. it's not like being in an american prison it's not like you know it's not some of the normal things that we see in that way and um it uh, anyway, mm. see. It seems it, it's it seems much less deferential yeah. than yeah. it should. Um, yeah, but it but it seems to me very much to the the Pentagon's credit um, that you know when the men came back, you know, although some were under a cloud, at the end they just said, okay, let's forget it, and no, and nobody was charged, and it was all swept under the rug. Yeah, that's that, that's the that's to me, I think, the 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 crux of the difference between what happened in 73 mm -hmm. and what happened later on with Garwood is that yeah. around 73, because you had you, and there were st there were still caskets of soldiers, you know, coming home. There were all of these wounded soldiers that were coming home. And then you have this group of POWs. And so I'm sure that the the um, political climate at the time was heavy with both sides but there was a there was much more of a of a thumb on the scales in terms of allowing these men to go on with their lives in whatever yeah. in what form that would take but as time went on and more you know more legend is established people talk more about the war and specifically about the POWs and it allows this cloud to to come along that obfuscates what actually happened yeah um, so I wanted to read this uh, little segment here from a New York Times article I found about about uh, Garwood. Uh -huh. um, and this is this is in reference to what you know, what uh, what he was accused of. Training officers say that um, that reaction is typical, that that the uh, that young infantrymen believe the private Garwood disgraced the uniform. On the other hand, there's much talk on the post and in the restaurants along the highway that the prosecution of private Garwood 
was unnecessary in light of the government's refusal to bring to trial other prisoners of war, including several officers, for cooperating with the enemy in a war the country would, would like to forget. Um, some older non-commissioned officers expressed two thoughts most often. First, they say that the Code of Conduct establishes an unrealistic standard for teenage servicemen, especially since after boot camp, virtually no training is given in methods to withstand torture. Um, and I think, you know, look, looking back on the, on the, you know, the very, very regular <clears throat> and with no space in it, you know, code of conduct that you're really asking, you know, kids, you're asking kids, you know, teen, teenage boys, but they're still, you know, they're still developing and everything sure. that they have to fulfill this very rigorous and very closed minded set of ideals dealing in a different culture in a different location and in a place where the U S military is no longer in control. Um, you know, is it's like, uh, there was that thing that happened. I, I can't, uh, remember what year it was, but seven or eight years ago that a, um, it was a, was a coast guard or, or Navy guys that they were, it was, it happened here in the, in the Persian Gulf, they were patrolling and they actually got, I don't know that they were used the word captured, but they got captured by Iran the Iranian right. Navy. And yeah, a few years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and part of their thing was to, you know, give an apology, give a, a, a something. And I, I don't recall exactly what the details of it were, but I remember thinking, you know, the military wanted to come down on these guys with every bit of, of, of uh, justice that they could possibly muster. And, like, wasn't this – they had guns pointed at them. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want the guys back in one piece? as opposed to having gone through an ordeal because they refused to to do what their captors said how True. how how tightly are we as americans willing to cling to this weird medieval sense of honor when it, it doesn't really mean anything and we don't acknowledge what's happening on the other side yeah you know even uh, john mccain as a pow uh recorded a a propaganda yeah. thing that was that was played to the prisoners and he he was never he was never prosecuted or anything for it. No, yeah, I I had uh, I had forgotten about that one. I know that he um that there were times that he helped negotiate uh, some of uh, the other guys go, uh, being let go because his name held such such clout. But that yeah. in addition to the the video you mentioned, shouldn't they have been held against him if we're going to do this very draconian sense of of military justice? Yeah, exactly. Sure. So let's let's go back for a minute. You mentioned about uh, reparations for the war and the, the the French French history with Vietnam in that way. And mm -hmm. um, will you talk a little bit about um, what actually what actually took place with that? The agreements that the mm -hmm. Americans made and and how it was it was never fulfilled. Right. Um, in 1972, uh, Henry Kissinger was desperately trying to negotiate an end to the war. I mean, because at that time, the the uh, uh, resistance to the war and the protests against it were absolutely monumental. And of course, President Nixon had campaigned in 68 that he would end the war. So one of the, so Kissinger accepted a series of Vietnamese demands, and one of them was war reparations. All right, to, depend, to determine exactly how much war reparations America had to pay, they established a separate committee. And that committee came up with, you know, the uh, figure of $3.25 billion to be paid up front and another $1 to $1.5 billion to be paid later, depending on different sorts of conditions. So they accepted that in the treaty. And the actual numbers and the actual commitment to, to pay that amount was written in a letter sent by President Nixon to the Prime Minister of North Vietnam, Pham Van Dong. And the Vietnamese accepted this as a binding commitment, as anybody would. It came from the American president. But what happened? America didn't pay. And the the rest of the prisoners weren't set home. And in Washington, they knew that what was going on, although in public, they denied that any prisoners remained. 
1977, there was a meeting between the two sides. Some of the same people who had negotiated the treaty were there. And the Vietnamese pulled out a copy of the Nixon letter and they said, hey, guys, what about this? This is black on white here. And the answer was that that uh, letter was not considered binding and it had no standing. And that is where the, the issue remained. Um, the Vietnamese never got their money and America never got its men back. Very, uh, very dramatic story, but that's how, that's how it happened. Our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are Will Arends, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Why I Am Anti-War Podcast, Scott Spaulding, Kenneth Cordasco, Corgoth, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style... You can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our awesome store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. The link is in the show notes. And now, let's get back to the podcast. And you said that... uh that the French, the French had had actually followed through on, on their commitment for it during their portion of, you know, years and years earlier when yeah. the French were in that, in that region. Yeah. Um, the, the last French payment to the Vietnamese, if you can imagine, the war ended in 54. The last French payment to the Vietnamese was in 1971. So you can imagine. So, and by the way, if you're thinking of about $4 billion, in 1973 money that's about 22 23 billion now so that's a good chunk of money uh 23 billion dollars i had to look up something you know to to give an idea of what that was that would be double the budget of the commerce department so it's a good chunk of change so uh phil i wanted i wanted to ask you you we uh you, you and I had talked earlier discussing your book about uh, eleven nine and the uh, and the terrorist who loves loves bonsai trees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, that was my previous novel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it takes it takes a few liberties with the with the known history of of the events the stories are surrounded by. Now this story deals with Vietnam POWs and the the idea the the chance that some were indeed abandoned in Vietnam. Um, and of course the last book that you had, you had mentioned that, uh, the story, the story presents the idea that September 11th, the attack on September 11th was a, uh, was a false flag attack. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. What would you, what would you say to someone who thinks that writing your stories in such a way could be seen as, and I, I, I don't think this, but I, uh, I had a couple of people ask me about it. Um, what would you say to someone who thinks that writing your stories in such a way might be pandering to conspiracy theorists, giving giving theories that don't have 
historical backing more visibility than they deserve. Mm -hmm. Well, in the first place, I don't much believe in conspiracy theories. I believe in looking at the facts and looking at all the facts, uh, some of which are presented by the mainstream media, and some of them are presented by very dedicated, very honest, uh, you might say, armchair detectives um, who do the, you know, do the research on their own. And it's not a question to me of believing in a conspiracy or, or an alternative theory or anything like that. It's a question of looking at the facts and saying, well, which which theory has more more credibility, which theory has more uh, um, is better documented, better researched and and presented factually and not with a lot of, you know, um, a lot of. Uh, you know, shouting and uh, and name calling and things like that. Um, now, in the case of uh, the Vietnam, uh, the the U.S. prisoners left in Vietnam, there's a great deal of evidence that they were left behind. Um, for example, the CIA had located a lot of of small prison camps, well, large and small, uh, where Americans were being held. But when the 600 men returned to America, they were, of course, debriefed and they discovered, uh, the investigators discovered that none of the men had returned from about a dozen different camps. So where were those men? Of course. Sure. Another, another thing is, um, uh, more than a thousand witnesses described seeing uh, Americans working out in fields and dressed in rags and, and things like that. And these, uh, their, their, uh, testimony was just dismissed by the defense intelligence agency saying they were unreliable. These were people trying to curry favor. A lot of them were, were refugees uh, from Vietnam and Laos and, uh, that they were trying to, um, help their cases individually. Um, another bit of evidence was picked up by Thai communication posts near uh, Laos, on the border with Laos, and they heard uh, conversations about prisoners, and about moving prisoners from one place to another. And the Thais were then considered unreliable, and their, their uh, reports were dismissed. Um, satellite photos picked up uh, words carved in rice patties um, that referred to, you know, like identification numbers and symbols and so on. Um, American intelligence deemed all of them just a, a lot of vegetation and shadows that had no, that were, were, were worth, worth nothing. Um, it's worth noting, however, that uh, two defense secretaries, James Schlesinger and Melton Laird, both testified to the Senate Select Committee on, on Prisoners of War that they believed that the Vietnamese still held men after the war. So that's not, not a small thing. Um, also, there was a, there was a, so, a Secret Service agent who overheard a conversation between President Reagan, Vice President Bush, the, the elder George Bush, of course, uh, and some others, um, discussing an and uh, an invitation, uh, an offer from the Vietnamese, uh, four billion dollars for for the men, uh, flat out. And he uh, later reported this uh, to others. And uh, this, uh, but again, in the uh, the Senate Select Committee, his testimony was uh, declared not not uh, not useful. Um, so there are a lot of things that, uh, you know, that happened and a lot of evidence and, uh, you know, a lot of evidence that things were covered up. And it's just a very, very sordid story. And, uh, and meanwhile, of course, these, these poor men, uh, they're in Vietnam waiting year after year, decade after decade, uh, prisoners for no, for no good reason at all. Vietnam, of course, can't admit that they're holding the prisoners. That wouldn't, yeah, that wouldn't look good, especially because by the 90s, they were trying to get into the World Trade Organization 
and, you know, get tourism and so on and so forth. And so the whole thing just went on and on and, and finally died of, you know, um, you know, just uh, of old age and, you know, now is, is no longer talked about. Um, so, and, uh, you know, I just hope that my book uh, is a sort of uh, homage to, to these men, uh, you know, um, and their, their uh, you know, the, the, the crime really committed against them. No, I know that the, uh, the, in doing the research that I did for us, us to talk, um, I know that that what was it? It was it was the mid '90s when um, was it the Kerry Committee? I think finally wrapped up its uh, its work, but that from the that there were um, sorry, I'm blanking on the word that there were people, there were politicians that did not agree with the final conclusions of, of those of those reports that they said that the yeah there were committee members who didn't agree. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and they said that they the the final conclusion. Or one of the final conclusions that one of those reports referenced um, talked about that that at this time we have no knowledge of living living POWs in Vietnam. However, that does not remove the re the idea that there may have been additional POWs who have since died or or other other circumstances befallen them. So yeah. th there is there is definitely. Um, a body of evidence to point to point that there was was someone or ones left behind that that was that was indeed what happened even if after the fact there was wasn't much way to prove it and I'm glad that you mentioned the thing about the the Thai the Thai radio chatter that had brought mm. that the it was it was at a time when when we as you know the Americans no longer had listening stations in that area but we wouldn't accept the reality of what the what the Thai listening stations had brought in and yeah. it was it was just a way to push it away and i'm sure that politicians over time you know as as more has come out about vietnam and the legacy of it has become more and more ugly um that no politician would want to attach themselves to that even to say we're going to try to bring these wayward americans home yeah. we're trying yeah. to legitimately yeah. go and, and and try to help them um yeah one of the things that i've i've sort of turned around uh in my mind sort of mulled over is all right nixon and kissinger did what they did the nixon letter i should add uh spelling out how much they would pay was secret a secret letter and didn't come to light until after the watergate uh scandal and nixon was already out of office and at that time congress uh passed a law that they wouldn't pay any money to vietnam but they didn't really know it wasn't really explained to congress what was at stake by not paying you see and so after that so who who really who really uh is at fault here and it seems to me that the real fault lies with president carter because he didn't he came into office without any baggage from the vietnam war and he could have sat down with with congressional leaders and said, look, gentlemen, if we don't pay, those poor men are not coming home. We have a commitment in black and white on the treaty that says we will pay war reparations. So we don't need to call it ransom. We already have a commitment to pay. So let's pay. Let's get this thing past us, get our men back and close the books on it. But he didn't do it. Actually, when um, of all the presidents after Vietnam after Nixon, um, that to which the the families of POWs and MIAs uh, appealed, you know, for uh, for help. Uh, Carter's administration was the least uh, understanding. They turned them away absolutely. There was no, there was they gave them no uh, no support, no time at all. And uh, so I think that a certain amount of the blame must go with Carter. Um, he could have solved it, gotten it past us. And I, and I think that that would have been the best, the best, uh, the best thing, but he didn't, he didn't want to be tarred with it. He didn't want to, uh, you know, to, to mess with it. And probably there was an awful lot of pressure from the Pentagon and, and others, you know, to, to move on. And uh, so I think that that's, uh, that's also part of the story. 
and that's it's it's interesting that so I know that Carter Carter provided um, uh, pardons for certain certain groups of of um, guys who was, escaped the draft who went yes, out. Yes, right, right. He pardoned the the people who escaped the draft who who uh, who didn't go in, right? And who made it. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I would say is that why you know why was it politically acceptable and uh, and crucial to him to make that choice? when he wouldn't uh wouldn't do what was necessary to bring home the other uh the other POWs or or even to attempt you know yeah, even yeah. even if it's believed very very skeptically by those people to to not attempt over time that that seems just absolutely negligent and thankfully because yeah. our um our relations with Vietnam have improved since that time um, you know, the 90s bringing about those uh, POW search teams that people yeah. that American groups actually went and did searches, went to some of the locations, went to uh, yeah. where uh, where Garwood was was held. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there really there is a lot of there's a lot of information out there for people that want to see it, who want to understand that there is a different slant yeah. to, this, to this story. Yeah. yeah, it seems to me that Carter may have calculated that he had used up an awful lot of political capital by pardoning, issuing a blanket pardon to uh, people who had evaded the draft. And maybe he thought that he had paid enough and didn't have enough political capital left over to, you know, to pay $4 billion, which, as I say, was a good chunk of money back then, yeah. um, to, to, get the, to get the men back. Who knows? Um, the, what goes on in, in the Oval Office is, uh, is a great mystery. So, yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you, um, what, uh, why fiction? Why, why, um, why do you use fiction as a, a vehicle for, um, understanding lesser known history? Some of the stuff that we're, we're talking about. Well, I think in fiction, you can understand the human element of stories a lot better. Fiction itself, and I'm talking here about books mainly, not so much movies, but in books you can get, in fiction you can get the point of view of a lot of different types of people, the types of people that you don't know, that you are not accustomed to. And so I think it's in fiction where you most get an idea of what human life is about. It gives you a lot of different perspectives of a lot of different situations. And so when I deal with uh, with Vietnam and the, the prisoners from a fictional point of view, what I'm trying to do is give you the point of view of the prisoners, of uh, the, the media, for example. At one point, the diplomat talks to a um, a man from a, a, a print uh, newspaper. I, I make sure not to mention anybody, but it's sort of like the New York Times or the, the Journal or the Post, uh, a newspaper that has a lot of foreign correspondence and so on. And I give you the mainstream media point of view about why they never get into big uh, uh, conspiracy conspiracy theories, as you might say, Um, they don't get into them because they consider their role vital to keeping the nation together as a people, to to giving them one narrative. And once they settle on the narrative, they are very reluctant to make any fundamental changes in it. You can add on a little bit, you can you know, do feature stories about one aspect of another, but you cannot change the basic narrative for one reason, because it discredits the the media to do that. And I think that's one reason why they have always given a cold shoulder, for example, to the alternative theories of, of uh, 9-11. Of course, there is a great, enormous, mountainous amount of evidence that suggests that, well, it's a little more complicated than 19 19- hijackers, uh, you know, on four planes. But to go back 
and trash all they've said and say, no, this is the new reality. They don't like to do that. And it's not so much because somebody at the top is telling them, you must say this. No, 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 that's not it. My, my brother is a reporter, or he was. He, he recently uh, left his newspaper. It's not that at all. It's that the reporter understands instinctively what he can say and what he cannot, what the newspaper's line is and what it isn't. And they know that they're not supposed to go against it. If they want to go against it, fine, but they've got to leave the paper and go and write a book. That's all that, that they can do. And so the media's point of view is that, you know, we're, we are one of the few uh, elements in America that keeps people together with a common narrative. And okay, there's there's something to be said for that too, especially uh, now in America, where you know the common narrative is is getting more and more ragged. So uh, that's uh, that's th that point of view that you can see in fiction, but you can't see it in factual things. I, I think is important too. Um, the point of view of the the, the, the prisoners uh, and the point of view of the diplomat. And, and going through all this and, you know, going against, basically going against uh, the, the uh, government policy. So it's in fiction where you can do these things and you can investigate these things. And you can't always do it uh, in uh, nonfiction. And even in films, it's difficult to do it because a film is a very concentrated form. I mean, my book, this, this novella, is 31,000 words. OK, you can read it in about two hours. A movie script is about 20, 25,000 words. OK, and that's a full movie. That's 90 minutes or two hours. OK, and you don't have the space in a movie because it has to be in a short form. 90 minutes, two hours. You don't have the time to enter all of those details, explain things and so on and so forth. This is one reason why. Um, why uh, thrillers, political thrillers, are very difficult to do in, in a movie form because there's so much detail that the, the audience has to master right at the beginning of the film in order to understand why, why the thing is important and why what is happening is, is, uh, is important. So, you know, I mean, me, I have to watch uh, a political thriller three or four times before I really understand what's going on with the, you know, the companies and the military and the government and the diplomats. So that's the thing, see. Yeah, the 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 medium definitely definitely makes a difference depending on on what your subject matter is. But um, I want to go back to just for a second to what you had mentioned about uh, about the New York Times is that the I've I've found as time has gone on that you find that that both journalists and government workers are very good at self-censoring that there is there is you know that they 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 don't need they don't need the um the lecture for on from on high because they understand what will happen if they, if they to take take those steps but it's it's not that you know someone comes and wags a finger in their face is that they very sure. deliberately understand the narrative as it's being created and they understand if they if they cross it but um mm -hmm. yeah. but it's i recently i recently read the uh um autobiography of seymour hirsch who mm -hmm. was the the great uh, reporter uh for the times and he you know broke a lot of the big stories the Malay massacre etc cetera, etc cetera. and one of the things that he talks about is being in the pentagon and being in the you know, among the different reporters there in the press room and some and so on, and how much the other reporters resented him and considered him a traitor because he was uncovering these things. Yeah. And, you know, that that's really a part of it, too. Those reporters, a lot of them consider themselves to be patriots and they've got to, you know, tell the story that makes the government and the country look good. OK, well, that's that's part of it, too. So I was curious about in terms of your your story writing process that how how do you differentiate between what historical elements to include 
and what fictional ones. I, I, I'm I'm curious. I know that. I mean, um, the the line between the two. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know that. Like your 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 story that we're talking about today definitely um, helps people much further understand the history that you're you're trying to to uh, break apart and elaborate on. But yes, how do you how do you determine that line? Well. I guess that I start with just the, the basic facts of the situation. And once I, I, I have the basic facts, then I start to, it's sort of like, it's sort of like cutting a diamond. You want to cut it so that the light catches it in the best way. You have the facts of the story. Uh, so how can I, how can I bring them out? How can I bring them to light in the best way? So with this story, for example, I wrote it one way as just the one man who returns to the United States. Um, he, he manages to return and he goes, he knows that he's going to have trouble proving who he is. So he, he organizes it so that he goes to his high school reunion, like the, the 40th reunion of, of his high school. And, of course, he walks in and everybody recognizes him. Hey, Joe, I haven't seen you. I thought you were captured or something like that. And then everybody recognizes him. And then he has a, a group of people who will vouch that this is the guy. I wrote it that way. Didn't work. I wrote it another way, kind of with a group of them. And that was okay. That was better. But the point of view was wrong. So I went, I told it from the point of view of a person who discovers the prisoners. Okay. So finally, the, 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 uh, format that I, I settled on was a little bit like Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where you have, where you have a narrator talking to a bunch of other people and telling his story. And that's, uh, that's finally how, how I got it. And this, I, I thought worked the best because then you have the point of view of the guy who discovers it. And you have the point of view of of uh, the people that he's telling it to and, and the people around him. So you see that the effect on the narrator, as well as the narrator telling the story. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating way to uh, to write a story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I ought to uh, I ought to add that uh, the second story in the book with a short story is. Uh, is about the bin Laden raid on Abbottabad, uh, Pakistan, and how I, I think that that was all sort of fictional <laughs> as well. And so I started with I started with the fact, widely reported, that the CIA went to Obama a day or two before the raid and said, Mr. President, we don't know if he's there. All right. They had had the house under surveillance at that time uh, for about six months. And I thought, that's 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 incredible. That's that's can't be the CIA cannot find one man in one house in six months. I mean, this isn't a gumshoe detective agency. This is this is the CIA. I mean, all you need is one recording of him saying, hey, can somebody please pass the salt? And you've got the voice recording, you've got the voice print, and you say, yes, that's our man. And they didn't have that in six months. And so I started with that fact, and I created a conversation in which, it's, it's sort of a satire, it's, sort of, it's a funny story, in which the CIA guy is explaining to a group of, of, uh, of intelligence chiefs that uh, he's not there. And the intelligence chief said, no, 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 he has to be there. We're all ready to go. And the CIA guy says, he's not there. And so one guy finally at the end of the table, who is an old intelligence hand, says, well, you don't have to say he's not there. Just say you have no proof he's not there. And slowly, among all the people sitting at the table, they sort of evolve the story, which is eventually the, the story that was told to the public. And uh, one of the points that I make in it is that, uh, you know, bin Laden was, was left-handed. 
Well, in the video that was released after the raid, there's a there's a video of bin Laden watching television and Obama is on the television. And the so I put a picture of this in the book, actually, and Obama or I'm sorry, um, bin Laden is sitting there on the floor watching this video and he's he has the remote control in his hand and it's his right hand not his left hand okay and so anyways uh i i put in the book that uh the uh this old hand from the intel says you know the 911 people caught me out on that on the on the video that we released um, soon after the, the raid, uh, the, uh, the invasion of, uh, of Afghanistan and our false bin Laden was holding a pencil in his right hand. And so just to stick one to those conspiracy theorists, tell our model for this upcoming video in, in Pakistan, tell him to hold the, the re remote control in his right hand, just to tell him that we don't care what they say. So, uh, Anyways, it's kind of a funny story. I, I enjoyed writing it. Uh, you, you reminded me of uh, the thing that Donald Rumsfeld used to say when he was still Secretary of Defense, that um, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. You know, and, and those, those, uh -huh. little, those little stupid sayings that, you know, that he used to work the press and stuff and essentially give them a non-answer. Essentially, yeah. you know, that that. Oh, well, it's not a big deal that that didn't turn up because these other seven things that we're, we're still looking at. Um, and, yeah. and that yeah. you know, just to play mind tricks on people just so they, they can't possibly understand it. But again, that, that's what politicians do in terms of trying to yeah. take reality and phrase it for their, for their own liking. Yeah, that's um, for sure. So there, uh, in addition to the one you just mentioned about, uh, Bin Laden, there are, uh, five other, short stories that you include with the book. I was wondering if you could give us just a, a little preview of what the other stories are about. Well, let's see. Uh, one story is about a, uh, a very uh, rich, uh, chic cocaine dealer uh, just living outside of New York. And he has trouble with the 15-year-old the boy who delivers his newspaper. And he sort of does a pulls a dirty trick on the on the the boy and the boy gets back at him. Uh, what else? Uh, another story is sort of based on a a woman that I knew as a boy who was always sort of organizing events in the in the neighborhood and she was really kind of kind of a bore. And anyways, uh, and then in the story, this guy meets her 20 years later and she's giving motivational speeches and uh and he sort of just by meeting this person and that person uh talks about her whole life and how she uh kind of went downhill in life uh uh after uh after that point um what else uh um there's another one about uh, a guy who who does a sort of candid camera. He's the producer of a candid camera um, uh, episode, and the episode goes just goes sideways, and the the uh, singer that they bring to this show ends up humiliated. And uh, it's it's really a it's really a mess. So, anyways, um, as I say, sort of in the in the blurb of the book, there are some political things, some personal things, some dramatic, some comic, and uh, you know, it's a a, a good uh, some good reads in it. I hope. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like a great grab bag of of different different ideas. I, I think it's I think it's wonderful. Um. So I uh, I think that's a, a good point for us to wrap it up for, t for today, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, would you um, please tell the listeners uh, where they can find your work and um, if you have any upcoming projects that they can look out for? Uh, let's see. Well, my, my book is called A Legacy of Chains and Other Stories. They can find it on Amazon and several other online bookshops. 
Um, and uh, also on Amazon, you can find my my other books, uh, Eleven Nine, for example, and uh, and others. Um, and uh, as to future projects, I'm just sort of starting to get going on some uh, some new things uh, after finishing up uh, with Legacy and. Uh, um, you know, doing a few interviews like this. And uh, I'm thinking about doing something with uh, FBI entrapment, where they take some guy and actually prepare the whole crime for him. And all he has to do is sort of push a button and then they can arrest him. But actually, the FBI has done everything. And so I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, thinking up a story to go a lot like that. It's... Uh... It's incredible when you when you really read about things like that, how devious and underhanded, especially in an ethical sense, uh, federal law enforcement can be not just federal law enforcement, but very specifically yeah, yeah. federal law enforcement at uh, at certain times. Yeah. John Kiriako has some really interesting articles about that. Uh, he, he's also one of the people who, who wrote a, bur a blurb on my book. So, yeah. Yeah, I know that man. That man's done some some really great work. I, I really enjoy see, hearing his perspectives on uh, mm -hmm. on the intelligence community. Um, all right, Phil. Well, I uh, I want to thank you for uh, for being with us today. I, uh, I I really enjoy reading your work, and uh, I do hope that you will uh, visit us again the next time you uh, you've uh, got some new stories to share. Yeah, you bet, you bet, Henry. Thanks for having me on, and uh, do give my best to Kagan and Danny. And uh, we'll talk to you again sometime. Sounds good, Phil. Sounds good. Well, that uh, wraps it up for us today, folks. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you take care. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www. Dot fortress on a hill dot com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never you forget. Good people we'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not.